we have a panel of four wonderful experts talking about um, achievements just over a year since Perseverance uh, landed on Mars. So we've got uh, Professor Sanjeev Gupta, uh, we've got Professor Mark Sefton, we've got Professor Caroline Smith, and we've got Dr. Kieran Hickman Lewis uh, talking to us uh, for, for the next session. Great. And they are going to be chaired by um, Alison Shern from the Natural History Museum. Hi there. Hi. Hi, Dallas. Thank you so much. It's it's so exciting to be here. Thank you so much for that intro as well. <laughs> giving up your afternoon slash evening and thank you for wearing such a topical jumper. Well, I, I do my best. I do my best. <laughs> I feel a bit underdressed now. Yeah, me too. I'm you, could made, you could have made a bit more effort. <laughs> We've been doing this all day. We've been, so we're, we're a bit, I know, no. I, oh, I've, yeah, so, so grateful. You've did, been doing an amazing job. So I'm I'm happy to give you a little bit of a break, <laughs> sort of 30 minute break. Yes, we're going to go and have a pizza and, uh, and listen to your wonderful panel. So thank you so much, Perfect. Alison. Take it away. Take it away, yes. Thank you so much. A huge, huge thank you to Dallas and Susie there. Um, it is, as I said, brilliant to be part of Mars Day celebrations today. And welcome to, to everyone joining us uh, for our celebration today. Um, uh, as Dallas and Susie said, I'm Alison. Um, I am a science communicator at the Natural History Museum in London. I'm your host for this evening. And tonight we are celebrating one year on Mars with Perseverance and NASA's Mars 2020 mission. And I am super excited to be able to talk with four of the UK scientists who are involved in key roles in this incredible mission. So we're going to be finding out a little bit about what's been happening uh, with NASA's uh, Mars 2020 over the last 12 to 13 months. And we're going to be discovering some of our scientists' personal highlights of the mission so far. Um, now, uh, this is your chance to ask questions too, I should stress. So if you've got any questions, do post those in the Q&A. We'll do our very best to, to respond to as many as, of those as we can in the short time that we have. But let me introduce you all to our speakers for tonight. Now, first up, we have Professor Sanjeev Gupta. Now, Sanjeev is a uh, geologist and planetary scientist and he is at Royal Society Leverhulme Trust Senior Research Fellow in the Department of Earth Sciences and Engineering at Imperial College London. So a very big welcome to, to Sanjeev. Are you there Sanjeev? Hi there. It's a bit noisy here. I'm just saying <laughs> I'm not in a disco. There's loud pop music but I'm not in a disco okay. I'm impressed. I'm very impressed. It's <laughs> lovely to have you. <laughs> Also joining us is uh, Professor Mark Sefton, who is an astrobiologist and by uh, astrobiologist in the Department of Earth Sciences and Engineering, also at Imperial College London. So, um, Mark, are you there? I'm here. Hope you can hear me. Uh, no, no theme tune music behind me. Unfortunately, not like oh, Sanji. Sadly, but a, but a lovely uh, appropriate poster behind you. I'm always in the shadow of Mars. That's right. <laughs> Also joining us tonight from the Natural History Museum in London is Professor Caroline Smith. She is Head of Earth Sciences Collections and Principal Curator of Meteorites at the museum. Hello, Caroline. Hi, Alison. It's lovely, lovely to see you. I'm looking really forward to this panel session with my fantastic uh, friends and colleagues. So hopefully we'll have some interesting things to say and looking forward to getting some good questions. Absolutely. And finally, by no means least, we have Dr. Kieran Hickman Lewis, who, who is a paleontologist and research fellow also from the Natural History Museum in London. Hello, Kieran. Good evening, Alison. Hopefully you can hear me. Yes. Hello. <laughs> yes. Hearing you loud and clear. It's Excellent. it's fantastic to have all of you to chat to today. Um, before we, though, dive into some highlights from the, the mission so far, could I ask uh, one of you to give us a, just a very brief reminder of the Mars 2020 mission objectives? What is this mission all about? Caroline, could I could I go to you for this this question? You could. I was hoping you'd go to Mark or Sandy. <laughs> yeah, I don't mind doing that. So one of the um, really amazing things about the Mars 2020 rover is it's the most complex robotic geologist that ever has been sent to Mars. And it's got an amazing array of different scientific instruments on it that are going to help us answer a number of really important scientific objectives. But one of the things that I am really excited about, and we'll talk a little bit about it later on, is the fact that for the first time, this rover has the capability 
of actually collecting samples of the interesting rock formations that we find. And then in maybe about 10 years time, we hope that those samples will be collected by some other missions. We've just heard about the sample retro, uh, sorry, we speak, sample fetch rover as part of the Mars sample return campaign. And those samples we hope will come back to Earth to be studied in laboratories in places like Imperial College and at the Natural History Museum. So that's one of the things that I'm really excited about is this sample return capability of the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover. But as I said, it's got a huge amount of amazing technology and capabilities on it that gives us such a fantastic way of studying the geology and the ancient environment of this amazing place, Jezero Crater, where the mission, mission is going. Absolutely. And, and Sanjeev, perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about the, the, the mission location at Jezero Crater. OK, so this is an absolutely amazing site that was chosen after a really major process where scientists whittled down and argued and debated about which landing site to go to. Um, and so this is a really ancient crater at the edge of an even larger impact basin on Mars. And the wonderful thing about this crater and why it was chosen was two things. Firstly, what you can see in this crater on the western edge is that we've got a valley coming into it. And that's a river valley that's entering the crater. And at the mouth of it, we see a big sort of a delta deposit. On the other side of the crater, what you can't see in this image, there's actually a valley going out of it which was water leaving the crater. So we know that actually there was a water in the crater and there was a lake in the crater. So immediately from orbital images, we knew there was once a lake and lake environments are excellent places as Mark will tell you about going to search for life as Kira will tell you. Um, the other thing about Jezero was there was a huge diversity of different rock types. And what planetary scientists do is rather than just going for one rock type, with a mission like this, they search for many different rock types so that we have a better chance of discovering all these wonderful things we wanted. So it's not just about life, but uh, discovering about planetary evolution. Absolutely. And the, the, the mission uh, landed safely, incredibly exciting. And we are getting all sorts of incredible data, but we have here our first 360 panorama. How did it feel when the mission landed safely and you started to get those, those images back? Oh, it's just extraordinary to see where, you know, somewhere we've been studying for so many years and to actually see real images of it. I mean, it did look pretty desolate and dusty, I have to say. <laughs> but in this image, what you can see right in the distance, you can actually see the crater rim. So those far off hills are the crater rim. We've got these low plains over here that are dusty that have yielded a huge surprise for the team that maybe Kieran will talk about. And in the mid-ground, you can actually see the rocks that I'm really interested in, which are the rocks of the delta. So those low-lying cliff lines are the delta uh, cliffs that we'll be heading to next. Absolutely incredible. And uh, yeah, it's it's amazing to see it. There's so much to talk about. I'm, I, it is a NASA mission, but obviously it's the, there's UK uh, involvement. We've got a whole host of, of experience and expertise in, in this virtual room here today. So I did wonder what, what are each of your, your core responsibilities, your, your core roles um, in, on the mission? So um, Sanjeev, if we start with you. So uh, partly I'm a scientist on a mission interpreting the rocks. I'm an expert in sedimentary rocks, uh, so delta rocks. But I'm also uh, what we call a long-term planner for the mission. So there's about 10 of us. And we work with project management and the engineer in laying out the strategic goals for the mission. So my main task is saying no to the scientists saying, you can't do this because we've <laughs> got to collect the samples and get them cached in time for the fetch rover to bring them back. So um, I run different meetings and make sure that the engineers and the scientists are talking together and make sure that daily operations work so it's quite exciting it's kind of like advanced logistics if you like absolutely brilliant and, and caroline you you've had a you've got a couple of, of roles on the on the mission is that right well uh sort of so i am um, I'm one of the scientists who are working on the sherlock instrument which i'll tell you a little bit about later on so that's one of the really amazing scientific instruments that uh is on the rover which can look at the composition of different rocks and minerals um but i've also been spending a long time um, for the last actually about 15 years or so, working with NASA and the European Space Agency, 
working out how we're going to get these samples back to Earth. And once we get them back to Earth, how we're actually going to look after them, how we're going to curate them and make sure that they're also available for scientists all around the world to study. So I'm, I'm not, not only involved in the mission as it's going around doing its thing, um, I'm thinking 10, 15, 20, 30 years ahead as well. So Sanjeev does long term planning. I do very long term planning. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and that is incredibly exciting as well. Mark, tell us your your uh, your role. You're, you're our astrobiologist. That's right. So I'm uh, I'm I'm the person who's um, trying to find evidence of life in the in the solar system and explain why if it's not there, why not? Um, so I I, I in, input science to the mission, uh, as Sanjeev said, uh, and I also do some operations, uh, acting as a return sample scientist, making sure that. The samples that we're collecting are the right ones to bring back for everyone back on Earth uh, to be analysed in the early 2030s. Also acts as a targeting scientist, which is which is interesting to make sure that the, the, the rover gets the right measurements while the countdown clock is ticking away. So no pressure. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and, and Kieran, our, our paleontologist, what's your, your area of expertise? What's your role? As a, so, as you mentioned, I'm a, I'm a paleontologist, but I I, stu I study the fossil record of of extremely ancient and extremely small microbial organisms. Um, I'm also one of the returned sample scientists. On the, on, the, on the mission so I'm also active in the in, in the day to day operations of the mission also also helping with with the selection of of, of appropriate samples for 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 return um, I'll talk about it in a bit more detail in a few in a few moments because I've been heavily involved in a few of the sampling activities over the course of the over the course of the recent months. Absolutely, absolutely. We're going to dig into that a little bit deeper, digging into the into the sampling a little bit uh, deeper later. Um, but the, the the mission has been uh, incredibly ambitious, incredibly exciting, incredibly successful so far. The last twelve to thirty months has seen uh, a number of firsts. Most famously, the the first helicopter flight on on another world. But I know that each of you have your you have your own personal um, highlights from the mission so far. So I wanted to chat through those with each of you. So I'm going to start with um, Sanji first of all, and an image a rather beautiful image that you uh, sent me. Uh, Sanjeev, talk us through what we're looking at here and why you chose this image. Okay, so this is an absolutely beautiful image. It's not true colour, it's been colour processed to bring out detail, so Mars isn't quite these wacky colours over <laughs> here. But once we landed, we had all these bizarre rocks around us that we didn't quite understand initially. But we have two amazing cameras, or three amazing cameras on the rover. Firstly, we have the Mars Cam Z stereo cameras, and they can zoom. It's the first time we have really zoom cameras. And so we were able to look two kilometers ahead at the rocks off the delta. This is a butte called Kodiak, sort of isolated hill called Kodiak. And when we first saw it, we took it at a very bad time of day. The light wasn't very bad. So we could see hints of things. And we took it an early morning view. And we could see these beautiful cliff faces with what you can see in the middle of the cliff face. We've got these packages of rocks. And you can see these very interesting inclined beds in there. And they're very distinctive for sedimentary geologists. Then we used this image to target a, a camera that we have on the SuperCam instrument, which is a laser, which is used for geochemistry, but it also has a high resolution camera. If we go to the next image, which shows a detail off the right-hand side, what we can see is in this package of rock, doesn't look very exciting for a non-geologist, but for a sedimentologist, it's just like the Twitter went wild when they saw this image. Um, so we had to actually write the paper very fast before somebody else did, because it's, it's clear as mud, basically, is that, in this package that's about 10 meters thick, we can see these large inclined layers of sedimentary rocks. And these are very, very distinctive of deltas. And so, you know, we 
hypothesized that that fan that we could see in Jezero was a delta, and a delta is a body of sediment that's deposited as a river enters a, a lake or the sea. Uh, but from orbit, we couldn't prove that. And this was the direct proof from on ground that we actually had a delta. So, you know, some of us who'd been involved with the landing site selection kind of heaved a sigh of relief because it was a bit worrying that would we actually find a delta when we landed because you never actually know until you actually land. Absolutely. And you say not, not an interesting image to if you're not a geologist, but to, to me, this is absolutely fascinating to be able to see those sedimentary layers. So Mars is, is alien, but also at the same time, yeah. very, very familiar, isn't it? So so is this telling us a little bit about the, the, the sort of the, the hydrological cycle? Of, yeah, of so the, it actually tells us something very precise. Um, and I'm actually going to go week after next, I'm going to go to Greece, which has wonderful examples of these on Earth that look exactly the same. But it tells us that the river was building out into the lake and actually in the, the thickness of that package is actually the water depth. So this is actually, a sh at this point, it was quite a shallow lake, about 10 meters deep. And what's interesting is that the base of those, those inclined layers are essentially a section through the front of the delta. And at the base, that's where the astrobiologists like Mark and Piron are interested in because those are fine-grained rocks that might contain organics, etc. So that will be our target for sampling. And we say uh, we 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 know that it, 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 this is a Jezero was a, a delta lake system. What what sort of time period are we talking about here? So when and and for how long? Ah, so this probably occurred. It's thought to have occurred very early in Mars's history, so about three point seven billion years. And that's from mm. some general relationships. Hopefully, the samples we collect will be able to give us more precise chronology because the samples will also be used for dating purposes. Um, but, um, and the duration is very difficult to tell. Again, we need to analyze this. So this is from two kilometers away. We're driving there now and hopefully by analyzing uh, the sediments, we'll be able to work out estimates for the duration. Um, but we don't know at the moment, but probably these are very early in Mars's history. And that's why this crater was chosen. Mm -hmm absolutely in incredible image and uh yeah I can't, I can't see wait to see what what else we 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 discover so this is allowing us to kind of recreate the the environment at, at that time on the on the larger yeah, scale i think we're sort of it's sort of slightly artistic in the sense that we're painting a picture of, of mm. what the landscape looked like 3.7 billion years ago on mars absolutely wonderful well sanjeev we will we will definitely come back to you but i'm 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 keen to to, to speak to the the rest of the group as well so i i know they all have their their own highlights so i'm gonna um move on to caroline now because you have a a particular um payload that you, you uh you wanted to, to chat to us about yes. uh, so one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that we've got about 82 million specimens at the natural history museum and we send those specimens to scientists all over the world and in fact one of the specimens from our meteorite collection which is a piece of a martian meteorite we actually sent back to mars on the perseverance rover so it's probably the furthest away we've ever sent any specimen from our collection since we've been sending specimens out to people so i mentioned that i'm on the sherlock uh, team as is actually kieran as well i think mark might be as well so Sherlock's a really interesting instrument, which is at the end of the arm. And it's a combination of an instrument called a spectrometer, which can look at the composition, the chemistry of different um, minerals. And also it can look at um, the, if there are any organic compounds there. And there's also a really fantastic camera called Watson. So it's like a dual, it's a dual, um, dual uh, payload. And in fact, there is something called a calibration target so we use the calibration target to actually test to see that the camera is working well and also that the instrument is working well. So if we if we think there's maybe a problem with the instrument, we can actually go and have a look at the calibration target, which has got very well understood materials on it. So this is one of my favourite images. This is actually one of the first images that came back of uh, when the arm was deployed. So for a few days after the mission, uh, landed, there was various tests going on to make sure everything had landed safely and everything worked. And this was the first deployment of the arm. And you can actually see the Sherlock instrument there is actually on the right hand side. 
and actually the, the the thing that does the drilling in which we'll hear more about um uh, in a minute is that that piece sort of at the i'm pointing at my screen of course you can't see what i'm pointing um, <laughs> i don't know whether you can see my mouse is no it's actually this bit here at the front Alison. this thing that's sort of facing us so that the sherlock and watson instrument is actually on the right hand side it's that sort of white thing that looks like it's got a bit of a triangle um, so if we could maybe go to the next uh, slide. So I mentioned, so one of our one of our meteorites is actually back on uh, Mars now. And this is an image of our colleague Ro um, at JPL, who's the deputy PI for the, um, the instrument. And this was him using a slice of the, uh, the meteorite in the labs at JPL to do some tests. And then that's the actual calibration target on the right hand side. And that's in a special oven that it's being used to clean um, and if we go on to the next image, so this is actually a picture of the calibration target and you can see there's, there's different materials there and that's the meteorite in the top uh, middle uh, circle there. So that's actually the slice of meteorite that's, that's on Mars now. But what's quite interesting, if you go to the, the next slide, you can see there's some materials at the bottom which look a bit strange. And what actually is happening is uh, one of the goals of the mission is to gain information about Mars's environment for potential future human explorers. And you know, if you are a human astronaut going to Mars, you're not going to go to Mars and stay there for a couple of days and then come back. You are going to be living there for quite a long time. And Mars has got quite an inhospitable environment. It's very dusty. It's very dry. Um, and so one of the things that NASA were very keen to do was actually test materials that could be used in um, especially things like the astronaut spacesuits uh, to see how they stand up to the, marsh, the harsh Martian environments of dust, the high amount of uh, ultraviolet light, things like that. So along the bottom are different materials that would be used in the astronaut spacesuits. And maybe if we can go to the next slide. These are some images that were taken. I've actually twisted these round so they look the right way up. Uh, but these are actually images that were taken just at the beginning of February by the Watson camera uh, on Sherlock. Um, and we can already see that the some of the spacesuit materials are getting quite stained orange with the, with the Martian dust. You can see the actual um, calibration target is now looking quite sort of a yellowy orange color as opposed to a nice metallic, clean metallic color. So we can see that there's dust already adhering to things. Um, and actually one of the things that's quite nice is that the meteorite is actually a type of uh, igneous rock, so a rock that's formed from volcanic processes. Um, and we were not particularly, we were like, well, it's good, but is it actually going to be really good for a calibration target? Because we're hoping to find sedimentary rocks and we know there are sedimentary rocks in Jezero. But as you will hear, a lot of the rocks we're finding in Jezero are actually volcanic rocks. So this has actually turned out to be an even better uh, type of material than we'd, we'd hoped. So we're, we're really pleased how it's worked out. That's absolutely brilliant. I just love the fact that we, we sent a, a piece of Mars back to Mars. Back to that's, Mars. <laughs> that's quite a journey, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Yes, we had to get uh, the permission of our registrar to do this. Uh, norm <laughs> normally when we send materials out for people to study, we like to get them back. And there's yeah. a very small chance we will get this back, but we decided <laughs> that the that the sacrifice of sending it to Mars and it possibly staying there forever was worth it because it's really going to be adding to the scientific data and the scientific story that that Mars 2020 is able to able to tell us. Absolutely, absolutely. And you you mentioned we have uh, we have quite a few uh, Martian uh, meteorites in, in our collection. What can we tell from sample return that we can't? tell from from meteorites from the, the the mars rocks that we already have yeah that's a great question Alison. so all of the martian meteorites we have they're all igneous rocks um, and as we know that there are a lot of igneous rocks uh, on mars but we also know there are sedimentary rocks so we don't have any sedimentary samples represented in the martian meteorites that's probably because they just simply don't survive being blasted off mars then coming through space and then landing on earth um, so it'd be really good to get some sedimentary samples, so unlike uh, the Martian meteorites that we have. But also another big thing with the Martian meteorites is we're not 100% sure where they came from on Mars. For some of them, we've got a vague idea and we think we might even be able to identify a specific source crater, but it's still a little bit sort of hand wavy. So what's really fantastic about the Mars 2020 mission and how it's collecting these samples is we can rove around, we can find interesting rocks, we can have a good look at those interesting rocks using all of the different instrumentation, and then we can decide to take a sample 
So we've got a lot of field context. We know exactly where that rock is from. We know if it was on top of something or underneath mm. something, we can really put it into its geological context. And that is really, really important to really fully understand the, the life story of that rock rather than just having a sort of random rock that falls from, from the sky every so often. Don't get me wrong, Marshall meteorites are great. <laughs> But of course, we really, we really need to do the sample return now to really be able to investigate these rocks using the full weight of the analytical equipment that we have on Earth. So which is why it's so important. The job that Kieran and Mark are doing is helping choose those best samples for us to, to bring back to answer these big questions like were the conditions for life right on Mars when, when these rocks were being formed? Do they even have evidence of life in them? And that's that's what Kieran and Mark are doing. Absolutely. So, so while we're on the subject of, of sampling, let, let's let's uh, move to to Kieran and uh, your highlight image, which is very intriguing. I'm going to um, share that now. Perhaps you can explain what we're looking at. Of course. So, when I was asked about a highlight image, I had a a bit of difficulty thinking what I would what I would choose because it's it's uh, 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 there's been so much so much interesting science out of the Perseverance mission over the last year. And certainly for me, one of the joys has been due to the, the time difference between here and here in California, who are operating the, operating the, the, the Arova, is that almost every morning I wake up to a new image of, image of, image of Mars, and this is a real, a real, a real delight. Um, the, the, the image I... Ch I, I uh, I chose here, however, being one of the one of the return sample scientists, is the the, the locality from which we took our first our first core samples. So this is a, a rock on the on the crater floor called a rochette, and as you see on the on the uh, 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 on the image, there are two two holes. In the rock, and these are the locations of our first two samples. And for me, this has been the the highlight so far because the obtainment of the first of the first uh, 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 core sample f certainly felt for me at the moment at which Mars sample return be became something of a reality. Now, uh, uh, now we have core samples that we can re return in the future for study here on here on earth and indeed as of as of this week i i, I believe we are in 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 the process of obtaining our eighth eighth core sample so here is an image of the location from which we took our fifth and sixth core samples, you'll see that the rocks here look somewhat different to the image you saw previously. And the, these are, are in fact from two different rock, rock formations on the, on the crater floor. So the suite of samples we've collected so far will tell us something about the, about the, about the diversity of of, uh, 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 of a geological uh, uh, materials across the crater floor. Uh, the, sum, uh, the, 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 the outcrop you see on the screen here is from is, is, is from one of the most ancient ancient parts of the of the crater. So as as was highlighted earlier on, this will really tell us something about was. Uh, 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 Mars habitable at this time deep in deep in the solar system's history and what can this tell us about the environmental conditions at the surface of the planet I think on the next screen we have some images from the actual actual coring operations so you see a small a small pile of dust at the in the, in the image of the left hand side and this is the surface of the previous image after, after, after coring, and the confirmation of the of, of the obtainment of the core sample is in the image at the uh, uh, at the uh, uh, at the right hand side. So in the middle of the in the middle of the of the drill here, you can see our core sample ready to be 
uh, cached in the in the rover. So th th these images are are taken during operation op op operations to to confirm the uh, the uh, the. Uh, the uh, the correct sampling of the of the of uh, 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 of the rocks, and as you see in the next images, we have two samples that are safely stored within their sample tubes. So th th these are are, are are materials that uh, that, uh, 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 that in about a decade's time will be returned to us here. Here for study, here for study on Earth, and uh, 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 these are Im I images, images taken j uh, just before the, the ceiling of the of the core tubes. So the uh, the, uh, the the rock samples you you see here really are the ones that will be made available for sample analyses in the future. That absolutely incredible images and it, it's mind-blowing when you think about it these are core samples of, of rocks from another planet that we are currently <laughs> drilling <laughs> as we speak so i think it's absolutely incredible it's it's mind-blowing um so yeah I'm, I'm very glad you you chose those those images kieran um I, I want to quickly move on to uh mark before we move on to extra questions to make sure that uh we we get mark's fantastic image in there as well so i'm just going to share that with you now and again mark perhaps if you can explain what we are looking at sure so um this is just just one image from me but uh quite a profound one really um so I'm an astrobiologist, so I'm really looking for evidence of life on other planets. And in this rock on Mars, we see organic matter being detected or organic compounds being detected. Um, Kieran mentioned habitability, um, and which is effectively conditions um, that, that could be or could host life. And we have evidence in these rocks of water. Um, there's evidence in the delta formations uh, that, that, that water was present, and that's one of the one of the criteria. Uh, then we need uh, a source of energy, and in some of these rocks, we have both oxidized and reduced minerals. And you put those two things together, and that's a, like a little uh, mineralogical battery that you can you can power biochemical systems with. And the other thing you need is raw materials, and to have organic matter on which all life as we know it is based is a really important discovery. So. All of the, the 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 recipe of life is starting to be accumulated, and these these measurements that are uh, are given us great hope for uh, evidence life in maybe these samples or maybe samples that we collect later later in the mission uh, that we're going to be able to detect uh, when we when we get back. We can only do a, a certain amount of limited measurements on the surface of Mars at present because a lot of our capability is in bringing the samples back. As Caroline said, once we get those samples back in the lab, we'll be like crime scene investigates, where we'll be looking at every single structure and mineral and every single association to try and work out whether we're actually dealing with uh, evidence of life back when there was there was life on Earth. So why not on Mars if if the conditions were similar? Absolutely, and that that crime scene analogy is actually a it's a really apt one actually. <laughs> I was going to ask you what are the, what exactly are are the, the the types of signatures that we are looking for the, those signatures of 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 early life. What exactly would a good biosignature be? So there are different types of biosignatures. Some sometimes you can see morphological features, fossils, uh, as 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 Kieran uh, maybe maybe mentioned. But the sorts of signatures that I look for are molecular fingerprints. Um, we can find carbon in the solar system, but once those carbon atoms are arranged in a way that is specifically tuned to help biological systems, they become very, very specific. And when we see those specific fingerprints that can't have been produced in any other way apart from being designed by life because of some sort of Darwinian chemical evolution process that shows just the right structure to do just the right job, we know we're dealing with evidence of life. And in a in a few grains of organic matter or a few drops of organic matter, we can reconstruct a whole ecosystem. So the organic contents are incredibly powerful. It is just like crime scene 
investigates will we, we look at the geological record as a uh, uh, as a forensic site um, and we try and extract every single organic signature we can and then just put it all back together uh, using our interpretive methods to reconstruct a Mars system from billions of years ago. It's in, uh, absolutely incredible. Um, we've we've had some question I noticed come through uh, from our viewers, so I just wanted to uh, quickly pose a couple of those uh, uh, to you before we uh, move on. Uh, Mark was asking uh, which country will be the first to send a crewed mission to Mars. Do we do we know that? Would anyone like to tackle that that question? <laughs> Well, I'll, I don't I'll, think we I'll, know. Yeah, I'll, I'll say something. Uh, Mars Sample Return is an international venture. Yeah. It, it brings communities and countries together. Wouldn't it be wonderful if uh, it was it was a human mission, a mission for humanity? I 100% agree. Absolutely. Uh, incredibly complex missions. You know, we, we have to collaborate, don't we? We have to co cooperate. Um, and we had a question come in from Daniel as well, um, asking if people were to go to mars when would that likely take place uh, sanjeev would you like to answer that one? Oh, again i think we don't really know there's not really a direct road map but you know we're preparing by sending nasa's preparing mm -hmm. by sending humans to back to the moon as a staging post so maybe the 2050s i don't know <laughs> i have no idea 2040s 2050s and there's been quite other work going on and a lot of what these missions are about is, for example, Perseverance has not only the spacesuits that Caroline was talking about, but um, there's an instrument on board that's making oxygen from carbon dioxide that we find in the Martian atmosphere, that's MOXIE, that's preparing the way to, you know, understanding the Martian environment and all the weather instruments, the weather station is monitoring the atmosphere and the weather on Mars to provide safety, the dust, et cetera, for astronauts. So we're building to that process, but we're not quite there yet. And a big aspect is um, human safety. But what I'm really proud of is actually, this is something really amazing, is that somebody I worked with on the Curiosity mission, Jessica Watkins, who I've just written a paper with, she's going to be an astronaut going to the international space station in a few months time and it's like i actually know a real astronaut that's amazing <laughs> and i've written a paper with them <laughs> that's absolutely brilliant yeah yeah i i uh I, I remember briefly considering applying myself and uh no i have i, I don't have the right stuff there's, there's no way nasa will let me let me into space but <laughs> Um, I did wonder what's the the long term plan for, for perseverance. Is it, it's a two year mission. Is is that right? But what's next for perseverance? Um, Sanjeev, would you like to answer that one yeah, as, as long term plan? So, so what we're doing, we've just finished off what we call the Crater Four camp campaign, sampling the rocks around the landing site and. As of today, we are driving, driving, driving. So we're not doing, going to do any science for the next month. We're going to be doing drives at almost 300 meters, two to 300 meters per day, which is kind of a record for Mars because we have this ability to, the rover has the ability to drive automatically. And we're going to be going to the Delta front that you can see in this beautiful Mars Cam Z image. And we're going to be going to this place called Hawksville Gap, which is a gap in the scarp of the Western Delta. And the key thing that you know, both Mark and Kiron and Caroline would be really excited about is sampling the basal delta strata for organics. And so what we can see just below the words Hawksville Gap, where you've got your things, we've got beautiful delta rocks. And our next year basically is going to be analyzing delta. So these rocks initially are then climbing onto the delta and heading towards the crater rim at the back that you can see over there. So the next year is about that drive from the front of the delta all the way to the crater rim. Again, sampling a whole set of new samples. And beyond that, we'll be driving out of the delta, uh, out of the crater, out of Jezero, and going to this outer Jezero area, which has extremely old rocks, much older than the crater itself. And there we will sample, you know, the oldest rocks we know of on Mars really in some aspects and quite bizarre rocks we don't really understand them to get an understanding of the Martian basement basically and the early geology of Mars. So much left to do so, so much exciting work still to come. Um, the uh, ultimate 
aim of the mission is 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 to to return the samples that that um, perseverance has has been collecting how and and when will that be um, achieved Kieran perhaps you could take that one as our, our um, one of our sample return specialists I can take this I th I think you've all already heard something about something about the, the the sample return plans in in previous in previous presentations but the and um, th uh, after after the after the samples have been obtained, these will be ga <laughs> gathered at specific places on on the, on the, on the surface of Mars in in, in in a sample caches. These caches will be will be collected by the the, the sample. The, the sample fetch rover in the hopefully not too distant future, and 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 a return to Earth by as as we were saying a multi a multi agency agency collaboration and and an international international collaboration on sample return. One of the interesting. Th th Things at the moment is that we're gathering. Is that through the course of the prime mission at the moment, we've been gathering uh, paired paired samples. So we will have m multiple examples of each of each of the rock types we're collecting. Uh, hopefully, most of which will be returned for study here. So it's it the. Uh, the uh, the sampling will be going on, as as Sanjeev said, for uh, for uh, for several years yet to come. Yes. Wonderful. And just in our last minute, I wanted to ask Caroline, what will happen to the specimen, the samples, once they're returned to Earth? Just briefly. So it's planned that they will land in the United States at a place called the Utah Test and Training Range. And there, there will be a very special laboratory set up so the samples can be extracted uh, from the Earth return capsule very safely. Um, and in fact, it's one of the things we're doing at the moment is actually working out how that process would happen, when it would happen, the type, different types of tests you would have to do at each stage to make sure those samples were safe because, you know, we've gone to a huge amount of effort to get these amazing samples from Mars. The last thing we want to do is open them up on Earth and get them contaminated with Earth stuff, especially as Mark was saying, we're looking for very sensitive signatures of potentially past biology on Mars. So we've got to do it really carefully. But as Kieran said, this is an international effort. There are international expert engineers and scientists from the United States, from Europe, from Canada, from all over the place working on this so that we've got these amazing samples coming back, hopefully in about 10 years time. And then scientists, people, people who are watching this today, maybe will be the scientists actually looking at these samples for decades and decades to come. It's really exciting. There's a lot of a lot of effort being put in to, to make this such a fantastic mission. It really is. And that is a it's a wonderful thought to end on as well. Thank you so much, Caroline. And thank you so much to all of our, our speakers today for your your insights um, and, and sharing your work with us. It's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you to our, our um, audience as well for sending those questions in. Um, brilliant. We hope that you enjoyed our talk today, but we will say good evening uh, to you for now and uh, on to on to the next talk, I believe. Thank you. We're muted. Alison, thank you very much indeed for that, for doing such a sterling job. Thank you to our lovely girl. What a fascinating panel. That was brilliant. Absolutely. I could just listen to Sanjeev talking about sedimentary rocks all night. It's just, you know, this is voice, it's everything. It's good. It's just really good. <laughs> thank you. Really, really. I've got a whole bunch of questions, but I don't think we've, we've got time now, unfortunately. Never mind. Never mind. But thank you very much indeed. Yes, great.